Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you have given us your word. And we thank you, Lord, that your word gives us life. And we pray now while we partake of this word that you would give us nourishment. And that anything else on our mind would just fade away. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, wrote this. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he, at any given time, may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. I've always been fascinated by the book of Exodus, and the story beginning with, with God revealing himself to Moses as the angel of the Lord who spoke to him through a burning bush that was not being consumed. There are so many wonderful examples of God revealing his power and his glory through all the stories in that book, like the plagues that he brought upon Egypt, doing something that only God could have done. And this forced the Pharaoh to admit there was no God was greater than the God of Israel, and certainly not him. Then after allowing Israel to leave, he changes his mind. And he takes off after them with his armies, and Israel is confronted by the Red Sea there, or the armies behind them, and yet God parts the Red Sea where they can walk through on dry land. Pharaoh's army tries the same thing. You know the story. The waves come crashing down upon them. There's the story of Israel wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, actually. And God revealed himself in terrifying ways through thunder and lightning and fog. And yet he provided daily their, their manna, the bread of heaven, the bread of angels. And he had quail drop at their feet so they might have meat to eat. He brought them water out of a rock that they might drink and be refreshed. And throughout the 40 years of wandering across the desert, their shoes or clothes did not wear out. And God had been for them so incredibly present. And God had been for them also the very one who struck them down when they turned away from him. And he dealt with them through his wrath. When Moses went up on the mountain to meet with God, he was allowed to behold God in all of his glory. But when he descended down the mountain, his face shone so brightly that he had to put a veil over his face because it terrified the children of Israel. And throughout the book of Exodus, God reveals his heart of love, his heart of patience, but also his terrible wrath. He gave warnings about coming up on the mountain without an invitation from God. And when they did, they must consecrate themselves. Even for Moses and the elders, when they were invited to come up, they had to consecrate themselves and prepare to meet the holy and living God, lest they die. And God continually revealed to them that he was holy and, and approaching him was, was dangerous, but also approaching him was what he was going to do something for them that they needed that only he could do. It's vitally important for them to understand that they were not like him and he was not like them. He was different. He was holy, holy, holy. Now, as you read these wonderful stories of God and his people, Does it remind you that this is the Lord of glory, the God of power, the God of strength, the God of mercy, the God that you worship, and not merely a fairy tale? 
Can you see yourself in this story? If you believe that your God does not change, does the way you think about him change when you encounter these stories? Again, do you see yourself as a child of God within that story? In our Old Testament lesson this morning, the prophet warns that in the day of God's judgment, people will seek to hide themselves, but there'll be no way to hide from him. In verses 11 and 17, they both assure that in that day, the arrogance and the haughtiness of men will be brought low and God will be exalted. Rightly should the Lord of hosts be exalted and praised and worshiped, and they should be in terror of the Lord and his majesty. Are you prepared to meet him? Psalm 89 begins with this joyous hymn. It turns into a lament. God had established an intimate relationship with David a father-son relationship. And that would extend to his sons if they were obedient to what God had called them to do as, as kings. God had been faithful to Israel, but it, whether or not he blessed them was contingent on whether or not they obeyed him. The psalmist remembers that even the heavenly beings in all creation should always remember who is God. Listen to Psalm 89, verses 5 to 8 again. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness to the, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? And who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, and your faithfulness all around you. The psalmist Ethan the Ezraite remembers that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. It's on this throne that he rules the heavens and the earth. His demands are not arbitrary, but are based upon his law. And he would deal with the lawbreaker based upon the righteousness and justice of his law. No one would be able to stand before God and claim innocence. They could not stand before the holiness and the majesty of God without being exposed for who they really were. There'd be no explanations as, as to why they turned away from him. But everyone would know the truth of their disobedience. Our reading from Psalm 89 ends with the reminder that those who consider themselves the people of God must remember who he is and worship accordingly. Verses 15 to 18 declare, Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt in your name all the day and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. And by your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. The festal shout is an acclamation of the greatness of God. But it's not just in times of victory, but it's in those times where you see there's no hope. But you choose to remember that God is greater than any obstacle that is in your path. I love Zephaniah 3.17, which is a war cry. It's of confidence. It's confidence in God when you're confronted by an adversary, a powerful enemy. The prophet writes, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exalt over you with loud singing. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, 32 to 40, 42, were not given in case the disciples ran into difficulty while they were following and obeying his commands, but were given because difficulties and persecution were guaranteed. If it were easy, then Jesus would not have needed to come to give his life as a ransom for many. 
it was and it is a war between light and between darkness. And since the beginning, it's been that way. And the battle will continue to rage for the disciples. Jesus, God in the flesh, who was sinless, came to pay the price of our sins. And that demanded a, a response of grateful gratitude and faithful obedience to the God who loved unconditionally those who initially rejected him. Any other response will be seen as in, uh, in gratitude and mockery, open mockery upon the cross of which Christ died. In Matthew 10, Jesus is not pulling any punches here, but he's laying out the gospel truth. In verses 16 to 31, he tells them that persecution would indeed come. And in verse 24, Jesus points out that a servant is not greater than his master. So when they see what is done to him, they should not be surprised when the same things happen to them, to those who follow him. Listen to verses 32 to 34. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. The word used for acknowledge here is homologio. It means to confess to declare openly, to praise, or to celebrate. And Jesus was telling his disciples then and us now that if we openly confess and praise and celebrate and obey Jesus Christ as our Lord, then he will declare to his Father in heaven that we are his. And that's to be celebrated in all of heaven. But if not, Jesus will deny before the Father that he even knows them. One of the most sobering passages in all of the scriptures is in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the, ones, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of, of lawlessness. Here's the thing. This passage is clearly intended for those who were within organized church, or organized religion. They called him Lord, Lord. And through the powerful name of Jesus, performed many miracles, amazing miracles. And the doubling of the name Lord, Lord, was seen as an address of, of intimacy. It's not claims or feelings of intimacy with Jesus that matters, nor is it simply good works that matter, even miraculous ones. But only on doing the will of the Father counts. Though this is a very sobering message, it, it's meant as a warning that being religious is not the goal. It's submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In this day and time, Christians everywhere are discovering Jesus' call on their lives. That it separates them from the values of society. And society responds, how? With persecution. It's war. I remember when I first initially made a profession of faith, I didn't change all that much initially. As a matter of fact, I changed gradually over a period of years. One day I'm having lunch with some, some guys that I, I worked with, and the idea of Christianity came up, and I said, I'm a Christian. And they said, really, we didn't know that. <laughs> Each Christian should be living a life for the glory of God that others might know him too. I once read that it's to be feared that many, many modern Christians, if are arrested for the crime of followed, following Jesus or tried in court, the charges would be dismissed for lack of evidence. The truth is that those who oppose the Word of God and the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord can often come from within our own families. 
Jesus knew that personally as his brothers initially thought that he was delusional in John chapter 7 verse 5. But listen to Jesus' warning in Matthew 10, 35 to 37 that we read this morning. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be done be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I think there are two reasons that Jesus chooses these examples. First is, it was common back then for young couples to live with the man's family when they first got married. The daughter-in-law, mother-in-law relationship, which has been the focus of many jokes, but that was Jesus pointing out a thing that was very common because sometimes there are conflicts that arise and it can divide like a sword when the issue is the difference between following Jesus or a God who has been the family's choice or, that, or no God at all, then problems can be significant. Jesus must matter more than any approval or even the civility of the family. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, what Christ is to you on earth, that you will be to Christ in heaven. I shall repeat that truth. Whatever Jesus Christ is to you on earth, you will be to him on the day of judgment. If he be dear and precious to you, you will be dear and precious to him. If you thought everything of him, he will think everything of you. The second reason I think Jesus uses the examples of those close to us is because it would have resonated in the minds of the Jewish listeners. Jesus quotes from Micah chapter 7, verses 5 to 7. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the, for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. I think sometimes this is confusing especially if you just read the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew chapter 5 through 7, where Jesus encourages us to live in peace and be peacemakers. But in this passage, he calls the individual to be, have a radical commitment to Jesus Christ himself. It's a message that divides those who love and follow him and those who don't to the unbeliever, a radical devotion to Christ seems fanatical and even mentally unhealthy. Over the years, I've been told by well-meaning friends that I'm taking this Jesus thing a little too far. But just in case anyone would have doubts as to the level of commitment that Jesus is calling for or even demanding, let's consider Matthew 10, 38 to 39. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's important to know that this is the first time that the word cross is mentioned in the book of Matthew, in his gospel. And it's not directly related to Jesus' crucifixion. However, the, the disciples would know exactly what the cross represented. When a person took up a cross in the time of Jesus, it was for one reason, they were going to die. The ancient Roman rulers did not negotiate or compromise or make deals. When you took up your cross, that was it. You were dead. Scottish theologian William Barclay said in his commentary on Matthew, when the Roman general Varius had broken the revolt of Judas of Galilee, he crucified 2,000 Jews and placed their crosses by the wayside along the roads to Galilee. This happened in 4 BC. So you can be sure the disciples knew of it. They knew the horror and the agony of the cross, and which was one of the cruelest and most terrifying ways to die. The Romans counted on that fear. 
and dread to keep those under their authority under their authority and in line. I've tried to imagine what the first disciples thought when Jesus compared following him with taking up a cross. What could taking up a cross have to do with following Jesus? Well, it's interesting how we use phrases to convey, convey something much less powerful than originally intended. People also uh, often use the language of bearing the cross because they, they have to do things that just aren't pleasant, things they would rather not do. And they say, well, it's, it's my cross to bear. It's not even close. So that there will be no misunderstanding, the Apostle Paul clears things up in our reading from Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 3 to 4 and, and verse 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Those who would follow the Lord Jesus must live in a paradox. We can only find the, our life by losing it. We can only, only live by dying. The resurrected life can only become after we take up our cross and follow Jesus. In Romans 6, 9 to 11, Paul sums it up perfectly. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So how do you do that? From the time of our birth, we're consumed with self-love. It's, it's our heart's condition. When we die to self and we surrender our lives to God's will and allowing Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, we give up those things that separate us from him and put barriers between him and his holiness. In other words, we bow down to the one who loved us enough to pay the price of our sins. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me, or for me. The disciples left their former lives and their occupations to follow Jesus. And they stayed with him when others left. They loved him and firmly believed that, that he was the Messiah that Israel had longed for. But when it came time to stand up for Jesus in the midst of the Sanhedrin or the, or the soldiers or the crowds, they all ran away, every one of them. It wasn't just a matter of putting to death old lifestyles or becoming more righteous and keeping God's law. Taking up their cross will require them laying down their lives if need be. I don't think it was a matter of not loving him, but a matter of not loving him more than their own lives. I know people who have been threatened with their own death or the death of others and remain faithful to God, choosing Jesus Christ. But I know someone who th was threatened as a missionary, he was threatened to with death if he did not deny Christ. And he said to himself, I'll do it, but I, I won't mean it. This was when he was a young missionary. But when he told me he was in his 70s, he had repented and God had forgiven him. But not a day went by that he did not, was not reminded of that. And he regretted that he did not give his life up. The difference that I've observed with, between those who stand firm in the face of terrible persecution and those who crumble has everything to do with the depth of their relationship with Christ and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. 
Daily following Jesus through his word and spirit is the lifestyle that deepens our relationship. And the difference in Peter and his denial that he even knew Jesus three times. And Jesus, who, I mean, Peter, who preaches in the book of Acts, has everything to do with a change of attitude toward Jesus, loving the, the life of Jesus more than his own life, but also the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. This is what happens when Jesus appeared to them after the resurrection and when they received the Holy Spirit. They were different people, a different willingness to live and die for the Lord. They saw him for who he was, and it was an honor to die for him. Jesus became the most important person in their lives. And he knew of the power of the Holy Spirit because it had changed him from the inside out. His walk with Jesus was certainly by faith, but not faith in Jesus' existence. He was very much assure, assured of that. But faith in the promises of what would happen if he, lived the, if he lived the resurrected life before his God. He knew the promises that awaited him. Forfeiting his life was nothing in comparison to seeing his Lord again face to face. Do you have that assurance? Do you know Jesus like that? If you do, whatever comes your way, you'll stand in faithfulness in the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you don't know him like that, he invites you to come and know him by faith, to bow before him and begin a new life, a life that will last for eternity. As I thought of these passages this week, I thought of them not only, in, but also in the, in, the, in the consideration what we're about to celebrate as a country. July 4th is Independence Day. And one of the things that I was reminded of is that it didn't happen because people got their way. It didn't happen because people sat there and waited for good things to happen. It happened because people fought for freedom. They fought not thinking about what was going to happen to them. They were looking at their children and their grandchildren and their neighbors. They wanted to give a free country so that they could live in peace, so they could live in harmony, so they could live knowing their God. You know, the old saying, freedom's never free. We know God would not have us live in bondage to sin either. And if you look at what's happening to our country right now, it has everything to do with turning our face away from God and embracing sin or embracing harmony and unity at all costs. That's not the message of the gospel. Jesus said, come and die. Jesus said, if you're, if you're, if you're united with those in your family more than you are him, then you don't know him. If you're not willing to live and die for him, you don't know him. But here's the good part. Knowing him is the most wonderful thing in the world. It's what gives us real life. And that's what we should want above all things. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you this morning and we are in deep gratitude for your love, for your mercy and your grace. That we sit here in freedom this morning to come and worship you without fear of people kicking down our door or demanding that we shut up and we, we don't meet anymore. Lord, that's, we don't have that happening, not yet. But Lord, we're asking you to speak to us through your spirit, to guide and direct us and reorient our thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Let us see, Lord, who you are. Let's see it through your word and through your spirit that we might realize that living for you and dying for you is the greatest honor that can be established. Lord, I pray that we will indeed be the light of Christ to those around us. And Lord Jesus, it's in your matchless name and the name that has merit before the Father. 
Amen.